If you want to open up your Bible, we are going to be reading from 1 Timothy chapter 2, and we will start at verse 1, and I will read all the way down to verse 15. So that is 1 Timothy 2, chapter 1, or sorry, 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. And if you were to say to me here this morning, if you were to say, James, I want you to take me to the most hated or debated or the most controversial passage in all the New Testament, I would take you to where we are going to be going here this morning. I believe this passage that we are about to look at is a passage that is avoided by a lot of people. I titled today's message, Does the Bible Allow a Woman to Preach? Does the Bible allow a woman to preach? Paul is writing to Timothy and he is giving him instructions for the church. We see that in chapter 3, verse 15. Paul said, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church. So Paul is writing to Timothy. He's giving him instructions for the church. And in chapter 2, which we're about to look at, the focus is on worship in God's household. We know that all scripture is God breathed, so this is God's message to Timothy through Paul. And we will start at verse 1. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is a testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. And here's the main text we will look at. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived. But the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. May God bless the reading of his word. As a lot of you know, I graduated from Acadia. And when I was doing my studies there, someone from one of my classes asked the professor about this text that we have before us. And specifically, he was asking about verse 12, where Paul said, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And when he asked the professor about this verse, the professor who held to an egalitarian view said that it was because of false teachers. And that is why a woman was not to teach or to exercise authority over a man in an assembled congregation. In other words, he was saying this was something that was limited to Paul's time. And he was saying that it doesn't apply to us today. Well, when I researched further, I discovered that there were no references in scripture of women false teachers at Ephesus. Wayne Grudem in his book, Countering the Claims of Evangelical Feminism, addressed how there is no clear proof of women teaching false doctrine at Ephesus, inside or outside the Bible. And he also addressed that the only references to false teachers identified at Ephesus were to men, not women. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 19 to 20, we read, Some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus 
and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. In 2 Timothy 2, 17-18, we read, Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. And in Acts 20, verse 30, Paul is speaking to the elders at a church in Ephesus, and he says, From among your own selves will arise men, speaking twisted things, to draw away the disciples after them. So in all three of these passages, we see that the false teachers that are named are men, not women. So if I could go back to the classroom at Acadia and ask the professor a question, I would ask him why Paul would silence the women and not the men. As the false teachers that were mentioned were all men. And why would Paul silence the, all the women? The professors claimed that it was because of false teachers is nothing but speculation. There is no evidence or scripture to support his claim. Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. Paul does not then go on to say, because of false teaching or because of her lack of education. Rather, he grounds his argument in the order of creation. The order of creation. Look at what it says in verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. We see that the creation order is still in effect. And Paul's appeal to the creation order is very good evidence that this is not something that was limited to Paul's day, as some people try and claim. I believe this is for all times and all places. This is for all the churches. A woman is not to teach or to exercise authority over a man in an assembled congregation, the church. This is what I believe Paul is prohibiting in this passage that we have before us. Paul said in verse 12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. In the book, Two Views on Women in Ministry, Craig L. Blomberg says, I quote, Turning to 1 Timothy 2.12, the primary thrust of the present tense in Greek is to refer to ongoing or continual action, not to highlight what is happening only momentarily. In other words, what Craig L. Blomberg believes this passage is saying in 1 Timothy 2.12 is, I continually do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. And as I said, Paul's appeal to the creation order is good evidence that this is ongoing and that it applies to us today. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. We see that Paul is going all the way back to Adam. This is before sin and death entered the world. Adam would have been in a completely different culture than Paul was. Adam was formed first. In Genesis 2 verse 7 we read that the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. If God wanted to, he could have created Adam and Eve at the exact same time. And yet we see that God created Adam first. And what we need to understand is that in the ancient world, the firstborn son was given a leadership role in the family. Now we know there were exceptions to the rule, but for Paul's original audience, they would have understood the firstborn as having authority. Adam was the firstborn. He was given a leadership role by God. The command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Who was that given to? It was given to Adam. And Adam most likely passed that along to Eve. And isn't it interesting that Eve sinned first, and yet who did God go to? He went to Adam before he went to Eve. Adam was the firstborn. Eve was his helper. They had roles that complemented one another. And just like there are biblical roles within a marriage, there are biblical roles within the church. And there are people who rebel against these roles, or they want to try and eliminate them. I took a course from Acadia on Baptist history. And one of the books that we had to read was called Baptist Through the Centuries by David Bevington. And one thing that stood out to me from Bevington's book was how feminist developments encourage fresh, fresh consideration of biblical guidelines. 
and how some believe that this did not give justice to the scriptures. Ordaining women as pastors would definitely be a fresh perspective, as this is something that is completely new to church history. And the pro in, in the last approximately 1900 years, this has not taken place. And there are churches that have folded on this issue. Feminism has hit the church. And there are churches that allow women to teach and to exercise authority over men on a weekly basis. In Wayne Grudem's book, Evangelical Feminism, he points out that women's ordination is not the final step in the process. He looked at denominations that approved of women's ordination from 1956 to 1976. And you know what he found? That several of them had large groups that were pressing for the approval of homosexual ordination. Just look at the United Church. What came first? The ordination of women or the ordination of homosexuals? Woman's ordination is not the final step in the process. Once you drift away from the Word of God, the drift will only get worse. And there are denominations that have drifted away from God's Word. And as a church, we need to submit to what the Word of God says. Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. What is she to remain quiet of? Teaching and exercising authority over a man in an assembled congregation, the church. Women teaching other women, women teaching children is not in view here. In other parts of, of the scriptures, we see that it is encouraged. In Titus 2, verse 3 to 4, we read, Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves, too much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. Older women should teach younger women and children as well. Women do not have the same role as men within the church. And one thing that I want to make extremely clear, and I should have probably already addressed at the beginning, is that men and women are both equal in the eyes of God in value, dignity, and worth. God loves both men and women. They are both created in the image of God. Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So I want to be clear, this is not about value. This is about roles within the church. And a difference in roles does not mean a difference in value. A difference in roles does not mean a difference in value. Men don't have babies. That does not mean that men are less valuable than women. It's simply not our role. Or think of the priests of the Old Testament. They were to come from the tribe of Levi. That doesn't mean that the other tribes were less valuable. It was, it, it was simply not their role. Women are not permitted to be elders. Pastors in the church where they're teaching and exercising authority over men. That doesn't mean that they are less valuable. It is simply not their role. If God intended women to be elders, you know what my question would be? How come there are no qualifications for them in the Bible? Because when you go to chapter 3, which is the chapter after the one we are looking at, Paul gives the qualifications for elders. And he says in 1 Timothy chapter 3, or verse 2, the husband of one wife. Well, only a man can fulfill that role. How can a woman be an elder when an elder is to be a one-woman man, the husband of one wife. And some people might be saying, well, James, that, that was just for the city of Ephesus. I would say no, because men were also required to be elders in Crete as well. When you go over to Titus 1, verse 5 to 6, Paul said, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town. As I directed you, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife. We see that men were required to be elders in Crete as well. This was not for one little area. Verse 5, Paul said, appoint elders in every town. Every town would have had male elders. And an elder is to be the husband of one wife, and only a man can fulfill that role. Now some of you might be saying, well, does that eliminate single people from this office? 
I would say no. I got into a bit of a debate with a woman pastor about this before. I told her that an elder is to be the husband of one wife, and only man can fulfill that role. And she basically said, well, I guess single people can't fill that role either. And because you were single, you can't be an elder, was, was basically what she was saying. And this was before I was married. I told her, I do not believe Paul is eliminating single people from this office. Paul was single. Jesus was single. And when you go over to 1 Corinthians 7, Paul looks at singleness as a gift. So I don't believe Paul is eliminating single people from this office. Although someone with multiple wives cannot be an elder. Because an elder is to be the husband of one wife. And if men don't meet the qualifications, they're not to be elders either. It's men who meet the qualifications that are to be elders. What if a woman says that she feels called by God to be an elder or to be a pastor where she's teaching and exercising authority over the church? Well, her feelings do not override what the scriptures say. Perhaps she's being called to another part of full-time ministry, and she has misplaced her call. But God is not going to call someone to disobey his word. We know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God does not change. His word does not change. And that is why we can pass it down from generation to generation. Because God does not change. I do not believe that God calls women to be pastors. Where they are teaching and exercising authority over men in the church. Our feelings do not override the scriptures. What if someone who has multiple wives feels called to be an elder? Well, the Bible says he must be the what? The husband of one wife. His feelings do not override the scriptures. And I want to be clear that both men and women are called to serve. They are both gifted by God. And there are women who, who no doubt have the gift of teaching, but they are to use their gift in a way that does not violate the scriptures. They can teach other women or children, and there are lots of ministries that are open and available to them. But they are not to teach or to exercise authority over a man in the church. Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And when you go to 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, we see that Paul's talking about the church. So he, he then grounds his argument in the order of creation, for Adam was formed first, then Eve, and then he grounds his argument in the order of the fall. The order of the fall. Verse 14. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Eve was deceived and fell into sin when she came from outside her husband's authority and took the lead. She was deceived by Satan, by the serpent, and fell into sin. She was the one who was led into error. The serpent deceived her. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, Paul said, But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. Eve was deceived and fell into sin, and Adam followed in her footsteps. He sinned, and he bore the primary responsibility for the fall for the entire human race. In Romans 5, and verse 12, Paul said, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that would be Adam, and death through sin, and so desperate to all men because all sin. The two reasons why a woman is not to teach or exercise authority over a man and the church is because of the order of creation and the order of the fall. And what I find interesting is that there is not one example in the entire Bible of a woman publicly teaching an assembled group of God's people. And that is what I believe Paul is prohibiting in this passage. In the book, Woman in the Church by Thomas Schreiner and Andreas Kosenberger, they do an in-depth study on 1 Timothy 2.12. Pages and pages. They go to the Greek and, and, and it's pages and pages. They, they go deeply into this. There's a whole book about it. And you know what the conclusion was at the end of the book? Paul meant what he said. And he said what he meant. 
I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, rather she is to remain quiet. That is a historic view. Ordaining women is something that is completely new to church history. And yet there are people who want to say that the text said it means the complete opposite of what it says. Paul says what he means, and he means what he says. And there are people that want to twist and distort the scriptures. And I want to look at a few objections because I understand that if I don't cover this well, you might come up to me after the service and say, well, what about this or what about that? So the first what we will look at is woman could prophesy. Woman could prophesy. Doesn't that mean that women can teach and exercise authority over men in the church? They could prophesy? Well, I would say no. In the book, Countering the Claims of Evangelical Feminism, Wayne Grudem addresses how prophecy and teaching are always viewed as separate gifts in the New Testament, and that they are not the same. So, for example, in Romans 12, verse 6 to 7, we read, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching. And in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28 to 29, we read, And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles and gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles? And the last one in Ephesians 4, verse 11, we read, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. From these examples, we see that prophecy and teaching are viewed separately, and they are not the same. Maybe you're wondering about women prophets like Miriam, Deborah, or Huldah. There are examples of women prophets, and that is an honored role. But prophets had different roles than teachers. The priests were the ones who were responsible for teaching God's law to the people, not the prophets. The priests were all men. And the New Testament, the apostles, were all men. Some people will try and say that Junia was a female apostle. Listen to what it says in Romans 16, verse 7. Greet Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen, and my fellow prisoners. They are well known to the apostles. This verse does not say that Junia is an apostle. It says they are well known to the apostles. In other words, the apostles knew them well. So we see that the apostles were all men. We know that Jesus chose 12 men. In the Gospels, we see that the women were the first eyewitnesses to the resurrection. And I think we would all agree that's the most important event in human history. And, and they were obedient to the angel's command. They went and told the disciples the good news. But the text doesn't say anything about them teaching and exercising authority over men in the church. And, and one thing that I found interesting is when it came time to replace Judas, according to Acts 1 of verse 21, it would be one of the men. So one of the men who has accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us. And the last one we will look at is Phoebe as a deacon. Phoebe as a deacon. In Romans 16, 1 we read, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Crenshaw. Or sorry, at Senkra. Some translations like the NIV will say deacon. In the book, God's Design for Men and Women, it addresses how serving as a deacon is not a teaching or a ruling function. This book also addresses that it is non-teaching and non-authoritative. And, and if you compare the qualifications between an elder and a deacon, you will notice that teaching is not under the qualifications of a deacon where it is for an elder. It doesn't say that Phoebe was an elder. It says that she was a servant, a deacon, not an elder. The office of an elder, pastor, overseer is restricted to men. And as I said, this does not mean that women are less valuable. It is simply not their role. Both men and women are called to serve. No one is called to sit on the sidelines. And just like men, women need to study and, and, and learn theology. And men and women are both called to, to share the good news. Look at the Samaritan woman in John 4. After meeting Jesus, she went back to the town and told everyone 
about Christ. And people from the town came to see Jesus. We are all called to share the good news. God loves both men and women. And God has gifted both men and women. And we are to use our gifts for the building up of the church. It is not a, a, a matter of if we should serve. It's a matter of where we should serve. We are all called to serve. As I said, no one's called to sit on the sidelines. And there are lots of ministries that are um, open and available to women. So the reason why a woman is not to teach or exercise authority over a man in an assembled congregation, we see in verse 13 and 14, is because of the order of creation and the order of the fall. And we know that the fall affected each and every single one of us. When Adam sinned, we sinned. When Adam fell, we fell. When sin came, death came. And, and we are all born with a sinful nature that was passed down through Adam. In Ephesians 2 of verse 1, Paul was letting his readers know about their past condition. He was letting them know about their life before Christ. And he said, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins. We enter this world spiritually dead, alienated from God. And God sent Jesus on a rescue mission to save sinners. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. Sinners like you and me. The second Adam came from heaven. And he took on the form of his servant. And he lived the life that we should have lived. And he died the death that we should have died. And Christ went to the cross and he died for his people. He received the penalty and the punishment that we deserve rose on the third day, and there is forgiveness of sins for everyone who will repent and place their faith and trust in Him. Jesus told His disciples in Luke 24, verse 47, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ for those who repent and turn to Him person is saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And God is the one who grants the repentance that leads to life. Apart from Christ, we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And we need God to make us alive in Christ. God is a holy God who is going to judge and punish sin. Put your faith in Christ. And what Christ has done, abandon trusting in your works or trusting in yourself in order to be made right with God. And trust in Christ alone for your salvation and you will have a home in heaven. There's a coming day of judgment. And if we leave this life without knowing Christ, we will fall under his judgment. As Paul said, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Surrender your life over to Jesus Christ here this morning. Let us pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for the privilege, Lord, of being able to serve you. We thank you, Lord, that a difference in roles does not mean a difference in value, that you love, Lord, both men and women. And yet we see that there are biblical roles in the church, and we know there are biblical roles within a marriage. And we know, Lord, that no one is called to sit on the sidelines, that we are all called to serve. And we just pray, Lord, that we will be faithful servants. We thank you so much, Lord, for sending the second Adam, that Christ left the glories of heaven, took on the form of a servant, and went to the cross, paying the penalty for our sins, the sins of everyone who will ever believe. Oh Lord, we thank you for the good news. Help us share the gospel with others and be faithful servants. I thank you, Lord, so much for everyone here. I pray that we will be filled with your spirit and that we will be bold in our faith. In Christ's name we pray all these things. Amen.